Hi folks! In this tutorial we're going to learn how to analyze articles using a sociological perspective. Sociology is a very important tool that you'll use not only in this course but hopefully in the rest of your life you've probably been using it already. And what sociology allows us to do is to discern between credible and incredible information. And so we get some tools to put in our toolkit that we can use throughout college, throughout our careers, to help us to understand whether or not what we're reading and seeing is reliable and valid information. So let's get us start here. So how is it that we know whether or not what we're reading is credible? Well, you know, there are some basics that you probably already know. Don't just take everything you read on the internet for granted, otherwise we'd believe all kinds of crazy information. Look for reputable scholars and authors to back up what you're writing and what you're reading. And so credibility is a really important construct in the field of sociology because as researchers, one of the things that we really have to work to maintain is our reliability. And so in interpreting research, you have to look for whether or not reliability and validity have met the appropriate threshold. And these are really important research terms. All right, so anytime you read research, anytime you want to find research to use, for example, for a research paper or a literature review, you want to be asking yourself two basic questions, and those questions pertain to reliability and validity. Reliability defined in a research sense is can you trust me, the researcher? Do I have the right credentials? Am I qualified? Do other people in the academic field uh, believe me and respect my writing? So you're going to be looking for, when you're looking for reliability, you're going to be looking for credentials, you're going to be looking for a history of writing books or writing research articles that have been validated through a peer review process. Those are really important things to look for, and that comes with practice. The more that you do research, the more papers you write for college, and the more research you do in a career setting, the more you get to be able to recognize whether or not the researcher is reliable. The second construct is the construct of validity. Did I measure what I told you I would measure when I set out to do my research? And in the field of sociology, this is a really important construct or concept, this idea of validity. Because sometimes you may start out a research project wanting to measure a specific thing, and as the research goes on month to month, you might find that as a researcher, you haven't really done a good job of capturing a good, solid measurement. And so again, this is one of those things that as you get more and more involved in doing research or reading research, you'll become more comfortable with trying to figure out or assess the validity of the actual research that you're reading. So again, reliability and validity, really important concepts for you to understand. Now in my opinion, because I'm a sociologist, there are a couple of things that sociologists do really well. This doesn't mean that other academics don't do these things well also, but I feel like I should express to you that sociologists spend a lot of time conceptualizing their research and then operationalizing their research. So let me tell you about, again, these two very important research concepts, conceptualizing. This means that as I start to think about research that I might want to do, I really take my time to think about what I want to research, how I want to research it. As I've spent my time planning how to do this research, taking that information in my head and putting it on the page so that when you, the reader, reads my research 
or reads about my research, you have a clear picture of exactly what it is I'm trying to do. So it's kind of like setting the stage. It's thinking about the mechanics of the research inside my head. For example, what kind of method will I use? What will my research design be? How will I measure using my variables, my independent and my dependent variables? Will I be able to find a population to study? And will I be able to get a random sample from that? Now, we'll cover the details of actual research design and method and variables in a later lecture. But for now, it's important for you to understand the idea behind what it means to conceptualize a research project. The other thing here is operationalizing. And this comes when I actually have the mechanics of the research on a page, so to speak. I've figured out what my method will be, what my design will be. I figured out my variables, independent and dependent, and potentially control variables. I've decided what my population will be, and I've figured out how to get data from them. So all of these things happen when we're operationalizing our research. And this is really, really important for you as a beginning student of sociology to understand. Operationalizing means that I can paint a clear picture for my reader that tells my reader exactly how I constructed my research project and why I did it that way and why that way is an effective way to gather data. That's the concept of operationalizing. All right now, through the course of this particular lecture series, which is going to teach you how to analyze what you're reading, we're going to be looking for some specific information. And as we go through this series of lectures, there will be about four or five of them, maybe a few more, we're going to learn some specific concepts. We're going to learn about population frames, units of measurement, generalizability, research questions, how to craft a hypothesis and how to identify a hypothesis in someone else's research. We're going to learn about variables and variable relationships. In the field of sociology specifically, we're going to learn about our research designs, our types of methods. We're going to learn about the different forms that data can take in the field of sociology. We're going to learn about research ethics, about the peer review process for researchers. We just learned about reliability and validity, so we've got those under control already. And then we're going to learn about how to interpret and understand research findings. So in this lecture series, when you find these particular things, you should be writing down those definitions or making note of them. So let's get a start with our first article. What I want you to do now is to read the article, New Research Finds Beauty Pressures Up. Now, I don't want you to worry about analyzing the article right now. What I want you to do is read it for comprehension. Make sure you can understand what happened with the research. How did the researchers go about doing their work, essentially? So pause this recording now, locate the link in your lesson to the article, and take a few minutes to read it. Interesting article, right? Okay, the first thing we're going to learn how to do is to identify the population frame. Now, population frame defined means the entire group, and that's usually people, but it could be, for example, a country or a city or something of that sort. So the entire group to which your research applies and from which you're going to draw a sample. Now, sampling isn't always possible. Sometimes you have a very, very small group that constitutes your population frame. As an example, my population frame may be one kindergarten class, in which case I'm not going to draw a sample. I'm just going to use the entire class as my population frame. So sampling only happens when you have a population frame that is so big 
that you couldn't possibly research every single person within that population frame. Let me give you an idea of what I mean here. Now let's say that my research involves a sample of all United States citizens. Could I actually survey, for example, every single person who is a citizen of the United States? No, that's actually an abstract number because people are being born and dying all of the time in the United States. And so I could never get an accurate representation of every single United States citizen. So what I have to do is I have to take a sample. If the United States is my population frame, meaning that every single citizen of the United States has an equal chance of being in my research project, then what I need to do is take a random sample of all US citizens, and I can do that. There are techniques that we have available to us as social science researchers that will allow us to get a sample that represents the population of the United States with regard to racial and ethnic composition, with regard to age, with regard to gender, with regard to urban versus rural environment, and so on and so forth. So it's my job as a researcher when I determine my population frame to make sure that I get a representative sample of that entire population. And when I do that, that means that I can generalize my findings, generalizability. All right, generalizability, another one of those really important research terms, especially when we're dealing with a large population frame from which we want to get a random sample. If we get a good random sample, meaning that if the characteristics of the sample I draw match the characteristics of my population frame, then I can generalize my findings. What I can say is that my findings match the larger population. Now that does not mean that every single person will have the same belief or attitude or feeling about what I'm trying to measure, but it means on average that most of the people in that population will share the same attitude, feeling, or belief. That's a really important thing for you to understand. So in order to determine when you're reading research, whether or not the research is representative or can be generalized, you have to know what your population frame is. So you have to be able to pick those things out. And sometimes when you're reading research, especially when you're reading it from just a general type of news article on the internet, that information might be left out. So you're gonna need to do some additional work. Okay, let's move on. So let's pause the recording now and go back to that article. Let's see if you can figure out the population frame for the research article, New Research Finds Beauty Pressures Up. Do that now. So now as you go through this article, there are actually two areas here which talk about how they drew their sample. The very first paragraph has some information, very brief. 10,500 females across 13 countries. And then as you go on a little bit further in the article, you find that there's also some more specific information towards the bottom. Researchers drew representative samples of 6,000 women aged 18 to 64 and 4,500 girls aged 10 to 17 in 13 countries. It lists most of the countries here. The countries were selected to represent diversity of women and girls in terms of culture, beliefs, social pressure, and economic development, as well as diversity of culture and tradition around beauty beliefs. The samples also accounted for variety with regard to age, region, and social class. So can we say that this research has representativeness for all women? Well, probably not, but it's probably pretty doggone close. They did a good job of trying to account for variety for women around the world, which means that 
we probably could generalize these findings. In other words, the 10,500 women and girls that were surveyed can be said to be representative of most women around the world. So that's how you look for a population frame. That's how you look for representativeness. That's how you look for generalizability. So is the population frame all women? Or is the population frame just the women in those countries? Well, if we're going to say that this research is generalizable and that it has representation for all women, our population frame is all women and girls in the world. So I hope that makes sense. And if it doesn't, now would be the time to ask on your discussion board. Now, another important concept when we're talking about population frames and representation is margin of error. Now, I don't wanna turn this into a statistics course, but we do have to understand in a basic kind of way the term margin of error. So, all units of a population have an equal chance to be selected if we're going to get a random sample that we can say represents that larger population frame. But, as I said, we know that there's never going to be one exact moment in time when every single unit of a population frame has an equal chance of participating. As I said, some people die, some people are born, people move away, people move in. So there's never a time when we can be absolutely 100% sure that our sample represents the population frame. And that's what causes a margin of error. The margin of error is the amount that your sample varies from your population frame. And so usually that's expressed in terms of a percentage. Generally speaking, it's a plus or minus, and you'll see it when you see statistical information reported. Let me give you an example. So when you see a statistic reported, in this case we're talking about ice cream flavors, you should see something that shows the margin of error. In this case, plus or minus three and a half percent. So we say 25% of citizens of the United States state that their favorite ice cream flavor is vanilla with a margin of error of three and a half percent. This means that the actual percentage of citizens could vary from a low of 21 and a half percent to a high of 28 and a half percent. So it's really important for you to be able to identify a margin of error when you're learning about statistics. I'll give you another prime example to think about. Right now, we're in the throes of a presidential election in the United States. And so it's really important that when you're digesting statistics about polling, in other words, who's on top, which candidate is doing better than the other, then you need to know what that margin of error is. If it's a low margin of error, then you can be relatively confident in those results. But if it's a really high margin of error, say seven or 8%, which would be unusual, but it is still sometimes reported, then you really need to think about what those statistics are saying to you. All right, let's move on. So the final thing that I wanna cover in this particular lecture is what a research question is. Now, I know that all of you have learned the scientific process since, oh, I don't know, maybe the third grade, and you should be really familiar, at least in a general kind of way, with the steps of the scientific process or the research process. When you develop a research question, you're at the very first step of the scientific process. And what you want to look for when you're trying to figure out what a research question might be for a particular research uh, project is, what are the researchers trying to measure? So when we look at the scientific process, we see that the very first thing we have to do is decide on our research topic and ask a question. What will I study? How will I frame that information? And so let's take a pause here to go back to our research article and see if we can figure out what the research question is. 
And sure enough, right in the second paragraph, we find the research question. Now it's not written as a question, but we can clearly pick it out here. This research asks the question, what impact does low body esteem have on a woman's ability to realize her potential? So if we take our time, we should be able to pick out that research question in the material that we're reading. So now I wanna go back to all of that information that you're going to be learning about, and let's see what we've covered in this particular lesson. We covered the concepts of population frame, generalizability, the research question. We also covered reliability and validity. And so these are things that you're going to have to have at least a good grasp on at this point to make sure that you can move yourself forward through the semester. And we'll cover these things several times throughout the semester. And you will also see questions related to these types of concepts on your midterm and on your final exam. All right, let me know what questions you have in the discussion board. And we'll be talking soon. Take care. Bye-bye.